Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship today, the 17th of July. It was good to have, well, worship in the park, worship in Trinity last week. Uh, It's hard to believe Farm and City Days was uh, already a week past, Uh, but a a good service, and uh, thank you for uh, those who did join us last week. It's always good for us to be able to worship together and uh, assert our unity in Christ. It's a good thing to do, and so I was grateful for our opportunity to worship with others last week. Uh, Coming up here in the next couple of weeks, uh, starting next Sunday, we're actually going to be gone for two Sundays in a row. We'll be on vacation. And actually, next Sunday, at probably this time, we'll be worshiping, as we usually do this uh, same week of the year, at Mount Carmel Lutheran Bible Camp. Uh, They always start their uh, week with worship, and so we'll be there next Sunday morning. Uh, But here, Reverend Sandy Miller from Oatana, she used to be the pastor at Hope, but she did just retire, I think, uh, maybe this last January. She'll be leading worship for us next weekend, uh, both uh, here and out in Otisco. And then the week after that, Just Friends will be singing. I don't know if anybody got to see them last night at the fair. Randy and Dennis were there. But uh, yeah, fresh off of their time at the fair, it was a good show last night. And they'll be here two weeks uh, from today. That, uh, two weeks from today, that's a great day to invite a, a friend to church and to be able to uh, worship with them and, and celebrate through music. So back of the schedule or back of the bulletin, that's the schedule for the next couple of weeks. Uh, also, you might look at the calendar in your newsletter. Uh, Audrey Stafford's birthday party will be, I think that's Thursday the 4th of August. I'll put that in next week's bulletin. Uh, it's an open house. Be down in the basement. She'll turn 100 year old, years old on that day. And then uh, three weeks from yesterday, which is going to be August the 6th, that will be the memorial service for Diane Fox. We've been working on uh, getting that planned, and so we'll look forward to uh, uh, having that family here in the building. That'll, that'll be, uh, like I said, three weeks from yesterday, August the 6th, 11 a.m., by the way. It's a big week for Lorna. Yeah, well, see, it's a big week for Lorna because she's finishing another trip around the earth, which reminds me that I am too. So, Our birthdays are Thursday. Anybody else in the last week or in the week coming up having a birthday? I feel so self-serving singing to myself this morning, but we wouldn't be doing this unless it was your birthday, Lorna. So, Anybody else? Uh, Ray, when's your birthday? Come. Next Friday, 22nd of July. Oh, all right, I didn't know you were so, so close to such greatness, right? <laughs> I'm speaking of Lorna, by the way. All right, happy birthday. Uh, God loves you, yeah, that, instead of trying to remember all the names. Happy birthday to you. there I forgot to mention there is a sign up we don't have anybody signed up for coffee hour the last half of the summer including today uh, so if you want to sign up for one of the next couple of weeks that would be great and then also the sign up sheet for meals on wheels which begins in August uh, that's on the table out there as well so on your way out the door if you want to do either of those things please do sign up uh, today, our scripture readings take us to the town of Bethany, that is the hometown of Lazarus. Uh, Jesus famously raises him from the dead in John chapter 11. Lazarus has a couple of sisters, though, that we meet earlier, Mary and Martha. We're going to read the story about the day that Jesus came to their house. And uh, the long and the short of the story is this, two sisters. Jesus was in the same house as the both of them. And yet on that day, one of them received the gift of salvation and the other one was just frankly too busy in order to hear Jesus' words to her. And so we're going to today consider the stories of Mary and Martha and Jesus' visit to their house. And to think of ourselves, these two women really kind of represent us as individuals quite well. We have these two different lives, our, our, our present busy life, but also this, this life to come that uh, Jesus has given us that needs to be nourished and nourished in a particular way. And so we'll be today reading the stories of uh, Mary and Martha and uh, uh, gaining wisdom from them as we continue our journeys. 
If you've got your blue hymnal, all songs today are from that book. If you're able, please rise. Our opening hymn is number 730. and sanctified by the Holy Spirit of God, we worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us come humbly before God and our brothers and sisters in the faith, confessing our sins, known and unknown, trusting in God's gracious word of forgiveness. brings life out of death and transforms the whole creation with a word. Forgive our disobedience and breathe on us the spirit of your righteousness. Free us from the power of sin, death, and the devil in our lives. Renew us with your loving spirit as you bring us from death to sin to life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Make us your instruments of peace and love in the world and free us from all that seeks to enslave us, trusting that your will for us is that we would be free to live fully into your mercy and grace. Amen. By the command and authority of Christ, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who grants us life eternal, the glory of the Father, who created us in love, and the power of the Holy Spirit, who forgives and renews our life, be with you all. Thank you. Together we pray. Shepherding God. Through your Son's cross, you draw all people to yourself and reconcile the relationship between you and your world, which we so carelessly neglect and break. Teach us to be your healing and reconciling presence in a wounded world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our 
first lesson and our gospel lesson are linked by a couple of things. Um, number one, Abram or Abraham and Sarah in the Genesis 18 reading are, are promised an offspring. And, and the gospel lesson, of course, is that off the offspring. Uh, to Abraham, he said, through you, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. And today, when Jesus is, Mary, is in Mary and Martha's house, that is the offspring blessing God's people. So there's that connection, but there's also uh, this element of hospitality, which is going to be important in both stories. Abraham and Martha both practice biblical hospitality. They, they drop everything when the visitor shows up. Our first uh, reading today, then, out of Genesis 18, uh, three special visitors. Two of them are angels. They will continue on to the town of Sodom, where they're going to uh, pronounce judgment upon that town for their severe lack of hospitality. But the third visitor that comes to Abram's tent, you'll, you'll hear it, he's called, O oh Lord. And, and actually in the Hebrew, it's, it's Yahweh. Uh, th this is one of the pre-New Testament appearances of Jesus in the flesh. Uh, he actually shows up at Abraham's door and promises that one day he'll be the offspring of Abraham. <laughs> that is the savior of the world. It's a strange story, but uh, these are the visitors who visit uh, Abraham. Uh, at this point, he and his wife have been wandering for 24 years since God made that promise to them. Uh, and on this day, Abraham is 99, Sarah is 89. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, while I bring a morsel of bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham quickly ran into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, three sayas of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, good and tender, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared, and he set it before them. And then he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And Abraham said, she's in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening in the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. There ends our first lesson. In your bulletin, you'll find verses 7 through 14 of Psalm number 27 printed. The Lord said to the psalmist, Seek my face. So in response, the poet asked God to teach him his ways and to lead him into all goodness and mercy. Together we read. For in the day of trouble, he shall keep me safe in his shelter. He shall hide me in the secrecy of his dwelling and set me high upon a rock. Even now he lifts up my head above my enemies round about me. Therefore, I will offer in his dwelling an oblation with sounds of great gladness. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hearken to my voice, O Lord, when I call. Have mercy on me and answer me. If you speak in my heart and say, Seek my face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not your face from me, nor turn away your servant in displeasure. You have been my helper. Cast me not away. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will sustain me. 
Our second lesson today comes from the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Coloss. It's called Colossians. We're in chapter 1. We started this uh, series last week. The Apostle Paul in the first chapter is always greeting uh, his recipients as, uh, as we would if we wrote somebody a letter or an email. Uh, St. Paul reminds the Colossians that before Jesus, they were captive to sin and to evil deeds that kept them alienated from God. But through the death of Christ, they've been made holy and above reproach before God. The mystery of God's love for all humanity has been revealed in Christ so that God may be known fully in the world. So Paul writes, You who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works it within me. There ends our second lesson. If you're able, please rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel for this sixth Sunday after Pentecost comes from Luke chapter 10. Jesus, uh, remember, at the end of chapter 9, set his face to go to Jerusalem. And so as he is headed in that direction, uh, he comes to the town of Bethany, which is uh, just a few miles outside of uh, Jerusalem, uh, three or four miles back in Jesus' day anyhow. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered that village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. So as the Apostle Paul is writing to the Colossians, he gives an insight into what his ministry is, and he also gives insight into what the ministry of these Colossians, these Christians, ought to be. What is is their job? Uh, In this first chapter of Colossians, he makes it uh, very plainly known. And so we're going to use these words today uh, to think about Mary and Martha and what it is that Jesus is trying to give to them as well, uh, because they're going to be the same thing. They're all in, in service of God reconciling the world to himself. And so Paul, as he's thinking about his own ministry and the ministry that he hopes these Colossians have in their town, and so we'll listen to these words for ourselves in our town, he says, my job is to make the word of God fully known. Right? It needs, needs to be preached and taught so that people know it. To make the word of God fully known, the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations but has now been revealed to his saints. To them, to us, God has chosen to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus coming to live inside of people. There's a a real strong 
uh, I, I don't know what you would call it, uh, tendency or desire into world, uh, in our world to, to think of God as somehow living inside one of us. And maybe you'll hear, and I see it on Facebook occasionally, the, the divinity that is inside of you. All you have to do is look inside yourself and let the, uh, the goodness and the, the godness well up inside of you like it's something that all human beings intrinsically possess because they're human beings. And it's a feel-good kind of religion, right? Uh, it really, it's kind of nice because nobody had to die for that. Um, but the, the scriptures do not teach that there is any divinity within human beings. Instead, uh, for us, divinity lives outside. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Apostle Paul says Jesus does wish to come and live inside of you, and he does so through faith, but he always does it in this way. Uh, he, it comes to us from the outside. It's not something that wells up inside of us. It is an external message that comes to us. Uh, and it is the message of the gospel. And it has to get into you either through your ears or through your eyes. Through your ears, through the public reading of God's word or the, the preaching of it, through your eyes as you open up the scriptures, this is how Jesus comes to live inside of us. It comes from the outside and it needs to get in. And so we're going to look at the gospel lesson today through this phrase, Christ in you, because you got two sisters and Jesus is in their living room. And yet Jesus is only inside of one of them because the other one was, was too busy to take time to sit at Jesus' feet. And so as we as Christians read this, we think, well, I don't, I don't want to be the Martha. I don't want to miss out on having Christ in me because I'm too busy running around tending to the needs of this world when Jesus is calling me to sit at his feet and to listen to my teaching. And I, you're here today because that's true of you as well. But I want us to, to think through this and, and look at it, not only for Mary and Martha and how that relates to ourselves, but to the people that we interact with on a daily basis. A lot of them think they have no need to sit at Jesus' feet and listen. Um, but the message of the church is it's vital. That's where salvation comes from. So today in that gospel lesson, Christ shows up in a living room in Bethany of, of Israel. Mary and Martha this is also Lazarus' house. Uh, we read Lazarus' story in John chapter 11. It's also the home of their father, Simon the former leper. They called him Simon the leper until Jesus healed him of his leprosy. Uh, and this is a house where Jesus will spend a lot of time, especially in the final week of his life. When we read in the Gospels, it says every night Jesus left Jerusalem during Holy Week and he went back out to Bethany, uh, where he ends up staying with Mary, Martha, Lazarus, who's alive again, and their father, Simon the leper. Uh, whatever Jesus says to Martha this day, she does take it to heart, because this becomes the, the sanctuary for Jesus during that final week of his life. This is the place where he wants to go at night and, and, and allow people to minister to him, even as he is about to minister to the world. And so... Before we read the story of Martha, she ends up getting it. But sometimes Jesus has to stop us in our tracks and say, Scott, sit down and listen. And that's not a bad thing. It worked for Martha, and we ought to think that it works for us as well. But let's think about this a second. Jesus is in their living room. That's a stunning statement. This is, this is the word made flesh, we call. This is the one who created the heavens and the earth by his word is sitting in their living room. It's a stunning statement. The word of God that visited Abraham in Genesis chapter 18 and told a 100-year-old or 99-year-old man and his 89-year-old wife that they were going to uh, have a son and that God was going to make a nation out of this yet unborn son one of whom's descendant was going to be the, the blessing to the earth, that guy is sitting in Martha and Mary's living room. The Word made flesh who put on human skin at Christmas is in their living room. This Word of God that calmed the seas, that walked on the waters, that cast out evil spirits, which heals people's bodies. We read these stories week in and week out, that same Jesus is sitting in their living room that day, and the same Jesus who will one day, on the final day, return in full view. He won't come secretly. It says, as Jesus went into heaven, he will return. And on that day, he will bring the resurrection of the dead, 
a brand new heavens and a brand new earth, that word is sitting in their living room in the town of Bethany. It's a stunning statement. Every once in a while, you've got to just stop back and see the forest for the trees. And even though Jesus is in that house, that doesn't necessarily mean he is inside the residence of that house, at least yet. And so these two sisters model two very different reactions to the word of God in their midst. We have the one sister, of course, Martha. She's famous, running around like a chicken with her head cut off. One translator said, if you were from the south, that's how you would translate that word, distracted. Uh, Martha, running around like a chicken with her head cut off. Jesus has shown up at her door, as have his 12 disciples, at least. There's 13 people showing up all of a sudden who are going to need to be cared for and fed. And so you can hardly blame Martha. She automatically kicks into hospitality mode, which is very important in the scriptures, very important. You actually saw it in the Old Testament. Abraham, when these three visitors show up to his tent, uh, he jumps into action and he makes sure there's bread made and there's water and he brings them uh, meat and cheese and curds and tends to their needs as they sit under the tree as he stands there beside them. This is what you did when a visitor came. You took very good care of them and Martha jumps into that same hospitality mode. And oftentimes Martha has been given a bad rap because everybody remembers her only according to this story. But we do have to remember that uh, after Jesus speaks with her, when you read about her in John chapter 11, when her brother Lazarus dies, uh, you see Martha very much uh, regarding Jesus as Lord and trusting in his promises. And the very fact that this is the house Jesus wants to stay in the night before uh, he is crucified um, speaks to how these have become his friends and how he has come to live in them. But before that happens, uh, Jesus does kind of need to rearrange her priorities a bit. Uh, this day that Jesus comes to town is a critical juncture in Martha's life. This is my learning for the week. I always kind of hope I learn something new. Uh, and I think my 18th ordination anniversary was this week. So a three-year cycle, this is at least the sixth time I've preached through this lesson. And so you kind of think, well, by six times, you ought to know everything, and thank God I don't, right? Because there's still all sorts of great new stuff to learn out there. And this is something I learned this week, that um, now this opens my eyes to other things in the scriptures. There are 10 times in the Bible where God calls somebody by their name twice, where he repeats their name. I was like, oh, I guess that's interesting trivia. But here it is. Each time that happens, when God addresses these people and repeats their name, it is a very important day in their lives. It's a life-changing day. It's a crossroads for them. And so on this day, Martha, Martha, this is an important day for Martha, and we're going to regard it as that. But just in case uh, you're wondering what some of these other ones are, the other two people who wrote lessons today, they've had the same thing happen to them. Abraham, Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 Back in Genesis 18, Abraham, you're going to have a son. One year from now, I'll come back and you'll have a son. Thirteen years after these three visitors come, you will find Abraham with Isaac up on Mount Moriah, tied up, laying on an altar, and, and Abraham has his dagger out and he is about to sacrifice his one and only son. What does God say to him? Abraham, Abraham. And he's stops, and God says, do not do that. Instead, I have provided a substitute, that ram stuck in the thicket. Take that ram out of the thicket, and you substitute that in the place of your son's life. We always remind ourselves that Mount Moriah is the future site of Jerusalem, that it is probably on that same mountain where God provides his own son as the substitute sacrifice for the sins of humanity. Abraham, Abraham, Genesis 22. Colossians, we read that today. That's the Christian Apostle Paul who's um, planning churches and writing back to them and encouraging them in Christ. Before that happened, God one day had to say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Jesus, remember on that day, strikes Saul blind. And in those three days afterwards, Jesus and Saul have a literal come to Jesus meeting. And during that time, Saul becomes convinced that Jesus is not the enemy, but that he is the Messiah, 
that he is the hope of the world, and that the rest of his life will be spent proclaiming Christ. But it started on a day where God said, Saul, Saul. Eight other times, but the sermon's not long enough for that today, but they are in the scriptures. You can maybe Google it later, and you can read the rest of them. Martha, Martha, today. She gets lumped into that very elite group of people, uh, people that, that Jesus wants to have a life-changing moment with. It's as if he says, Martha, Martha, I don't want you to miss out on having Jesus inside of you because you're too busy with the things of this present life to sit at his feet and to pay attention. Now, it says that Martha was distracted by a great many things. The Greek word for that is paraspao. I don't expect you to remember that. Uh, paraspao literally means dragged around. Kind of like that image, right? Any of you ever feel dragged around by life? Martha's being dragged around by responsibility and obligation at this point that Jesus comes to visit her house. Martha, Martha, you are being dragged around by many responsibilities. One of the other great places that word paraspao is found is in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, King Solomon, wisest man that ever lived, gets to the end of his life, and I encourage you to read Ecclesiastes. It was in my daily Bible readings uh, within the last couple of weeks. I was just reminded what a treasure this book is. Some people read Ecclesiastes and say it's kind of depressing because, well, Solomon makes it sound like life is hard. That's the point. Even though King Solomon is rich and wise, at the end of his life, he says this. You know, living in this broken world, we've been banished from the Garden of Eden. God said, by the sweat of your brow, you must now toil and feed yourself. And Solomon says, you know what? This is what I found at the end of my long life. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. It's an unhappy business God has given to the children of man to be dragged around by, paraspao. Translation, we're all dragged around by the business of all of the things that we have to do in this life. And in the very next sentence, what does uh, Solomon say? But you know what it feels like? It feels like trying to catch the wind. I love that image. Always grasping, but never capturing. You, you, you never really get there. It's always elusive. And one day you think the wind stopped blowing, and guess what? The next day you're going to be picking up sticks again. I think we all know what that's like, right? Yeah, I still have sticks out in my yard that I still need to pick up. When is this wind ever going to end? Solomon says that's what life is like. We're dragged around by it, and, and, and you can never really wrap your arms around it. This is maybe the picture that we get of Martha on this day. She is paraspao. Anybody else feel that way? I asked this question at the care center the other day. We had worship on Thursday morning. How about when you walk up to somebody and say, how are you doing today? They say, you know what? I am so rested and I have so much extra energy, I don't really know where to spend it all. Any of you said that this week? Nobody, yeah. I didn't either, right? What do, you, what do people say? Tired. We're worn out. Chasing after the wind is hard work. And we will do it every day. It's probably no wonder that people say they are tired. If you are married, marriage is work. I hope I'm worth your effort, right? But there's work involved in that. When you have a family, there's work involved. And when that work's done, then you go to work. And even when you're retired, retired people, you know it, right? Some of you work, you don't get paid the same as you used to, but you still work just as hard. And you kind of thought, maybe one day I'll retire, I'll just lay on the beach sipping margaritas all day while people feed me grapes and fan me, right? Does that happen? <laughs> Not here, huh? Only, only LaVoy, huh? Yeah. It doesn't happen, does it? We're busy, work. If you have a house, is there a project in your house that needs doing? You've been walking around it so long, you just kind of almost ignore it? Mm-hmm. Yep, and in the midst of all of that, guess what? You've got to eat three meals today. And somebody's got to buy that food, somebody's got to cook it, and then you've got to clean the dishes up, and you're just going to do all that so you can do it again in a couple of hours. During that wonderful meal you've prepared for yourself, you spill on your shirt, and you say, oh, now I've got to do laundry again. Didn't I just do laundry last week? You've got to balance the checkbook, you've got to mow the lawn, although not as much this summer as we talked about earlier with some of us. And then, if you're like me, you're taking your car to Ike's tonight and leaving it there, for the second time in three weeks. 
Worn out. Worn out. I feel like I'm dragged about by this life. That's just me making a little list. You can add your own, self, uh, your own stuff to that. You add in there things like grief and, and illness and bodies that don't work the way they used to. Man, we are dragged around all of the time. We find ourselves in Martha. We're dealing with the stuff of this present life and it wears us out. So what is the remedy or the alternative? Well, while you have life in your body, this is the way it's going to be. But there's another sister, and she does something which is important to us, and I think you know that because you're sitting here today, aren't you? You decided, I'm going to take an hour out of my being dragged around by life, and I'm going to go listen to Jesus. I'm going to go listen to his teaching. I, I, I need Jesus to keep me going in the midst of being dragged around. And that's what Mary is doing. Even though Jesus shows up in her house and says she was sitting at his feet listening to his teaching. That's what a disciple did. They sat on the ground so that the uh, rabbi was always higher than them so that his wisdom, like a stream or a river, flowed down to them. And this is what Mary is doing. She is soaking up everything that Jesus has to say to her. And I doubt Jesus is sitting there saying, that's a warm one today. I guess we need some rain, right? That's how I sit around and chat with people. I doubt that's the way Jesus ministered to others. No, Jesus is handing over the goods to Mary. He's, he's explaining to her how he is that mystery that has been hidden for ages and generations that, that this God who all the way back in the Garden of Eden when, when humanity sinned and they ate the apple, God said, one day I will destroy the work that Satan has begun here. And Jesus can say to Mary, that's why I'm here. I'm on my way to Jerusalem to do just that. Uh, he's handing over the gifts of forgiveness uh, Mary, God knows your name. He sees you. Yeah, he's the God who created the heavens and the earth. And I was hearing about this telescope this week that can see all these billions of new galaxies out there. Have you ever seen these pictures? I guess they're pretty amazing. That God knows your name, Mary. And he loves you so much that he put me into the flesh so that I could come and, and restore the relationship between you and the Father. Jesus is handing over the goods to Mary as she's sitting there. Oh, by the way, Mary, one day when I return, I will make all things new. New heaven, new earth, no more death, tears, crying, pain, this chasing after the wind. One day, that'll be done. This is me coming to recreate what was broken in the fall. Mary gets that that day, and what's Martha doing? She's running around. She's not getting the words in her ears because she's too busy. It's no wonder that... When she finally runs up and says, Jesus, tell my sister to quit being lazy and tell her to get up and help me. And Jesus says, absolutely not. She has chosen the good portion. You're out there whipping up a good portion for us in your kitchen, uh, this food that you're going to feed us, and then in a couple hours we're going to be hungry again. It's chasing after the wind. While you're making for us a delicious portion, Mary has chosen the good portion. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. John chapter six, that's a good chapter to read as well. I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of this bread will never hunger or thirst. This is Jesus comparing himself to bread. You are running around chasing this bread to put in your stomach and he says, but I have the words that can truly satisfy. I have the words of eternal life. Mary gets that. Martha misses out on Jesus even though he's sitting in her living room. And so Jesus confronts her that day and says, this is the necessary thing. The implication is, Martha, you should do this too. It's important to stop in the midst of the busyness and listen to Jesus and his teachings. This is why we have church each and every Sunday. It is an hour where we stop the madness and we come in here and we say, Jesus, tell me a better story. Tell me I'm loved by you and that I belong to you and that Jesus hands those gifts over to us as we worship. So glad for that. These two sisters represent the two lives that each of us has. This present life running around in the world, dragged around by it perhaps, but also this life to come. It's not something you get just on the day that you die, but it reaches back into our present life. It's here amongst us this morning. We, we live with hope and we live with faith because we know that God has given us Jesus, and that one day he is going to make all things new. These two sisters represent these two lives to come. As we take time to sit at Jesus' feet, he is the living bread, and I trust that this morning he has fed us 
with the eternal food that only he can give. We're going to sing in response to this blue hymnal number 777. In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. If you're able, please stand as we sing. by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Thank you. Let's take a moment and share the peace with those around you. Prayer is printed in your bulletin. Benevolent God, you have granted us in abundance with all the good things that life has to offer. May we be truly grateful for our daily bread, even as we return a portion of what you have first given us as a sign of our humility and thanksgiving for your bounteous gifts. Let the treasures we have received from you be used to serve the world you love. Amen. This time we pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus. We do pray for all people according to their needs. Merciful God, create in your church faithful stewards of the divine mystery which you have revealed to us in Jesus. Through his body on earth, draw all people to Christ that they might be reconciled to you and know that peace that comes only through faith in the redeeming work of the cross. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we do pray for the congregations of our area, as we read in the paper this week, many of whom will be offering vacation Bible school programs in the coming weeks. We pray that you would bless the teachers and the volunteers of those events with imagination, creativity, and joy in their serving. And through their efforts, we pray that you would reveal your love and life-giving gospel to children and communities across our area. For those who know it well and for those who will hear it for the first time, may the gospel fall upon open ears, hearts, and minds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also give you thanks for the gift of community. We thank you for our Farm and City Days last weekend and uh, the joy that it is to, to be together and to celebrate, especially uh, area Christians. We're grateful that we were able to worship together last week, and we continue to ask your blessing upon each and every one of those congregations and their leaders. And as we celebrate Waseca County, you know, we thank you for that fair and uh, the fair board and those who have put their time and energy uh, into that. It's, it's good when we live together and we do so in harmony. And so we especially thank you for our area. We ask your continued blessing on it, its people, its economies, and its government. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, we pray for your work to be done in all who suffer this day, whether that's emotional, spiritual, or physical illness. We pray for the healing hands that you have called to care for your people, that you would grant them success. We ask that you would give your comfort and peace and your healing to all who are in need today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. These things, Heavenly Father, we ask for today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We also pray as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We begin this brand new week in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which, indeed, you were called in one body. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as Paul said today, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. 
You know, that promise to Abraham that through him and through the people of Israel, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. Uh, we are the, uh, the uh, spiritual descendants of, uh, of uh, these people, Israel, and Jesus, the true Israelite. Our closing hymn today, Blessed Be the God of Israel. It's number 725.